Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon, sir. Madam Speaker, three, just a que few questions to the proponent of the amendment for clarification. You may proceed, sir. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you, Madam Speaker, in, in hearing this conversation and the debate, I want to be clear that the dollars that are being talked about are discussed here are institutional dollars and not taxpaying dollars. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Through you, Madam Speaker, yes, that is correct. These are uh, institutional dollars that are, that are come from a, we have a state policy that requires institutions to have, again, a policy to set aside a certain percentage of their uh, collected tuition revenue uh, and, to, and to provide that back to students in the form of institutional financial aid. That is the sole uh, source of dollars that we're talking about here today. It does not include any taxpayer uh, appropriated dollars um, or any federal dollars. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Madam Speaker, this institutional dollar, if I can think of it like a part of money to which the students can apply and get the necessary financial aid. Through you, Madam Speaker, could the good chair tell us as a track in the past, let's say for the last five years, has there been money left behind in the institutional dollars for which there have not been any applicants? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, um, I have a research report, and actually it's slightly mixed. I mean, for the most part, I think that um, the dollars that are collected are distributed. Um, there may, in some instances, be extremely small balances uh, left over in the total amount. Um, I think uh, that the cost of an edu college education has gotten, unfortunately, quite expensive, um, um, and, uh, and this... Uh, uh, fund, if you will, is used uh, to uh, ensure that no student is denied access to higher education. But for the most part, I think it would be safe to say that, uh, that the dollars collected are redistributed um, at the same time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. So through you, Madam Speaker, in the past years, the dollars that have been collected in, on, as institutional dollars, I get it, it's not a taxpayer dollar, it's from the institution, from the students paying into their, into this fund. That fund has been distributed by and large, close to about 100% to students who are deserving and who need the financial aid. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, yes. Um, I, that is done uh, based on need and based on merit. Um, and so I, I think you know, predominantly it's done for need-based scholarships, but there are instances when um, institutions use this same uh, pot of money to attract a particular student to their institution. Um, and, but uh, the, the goal, I think, of all the institutions, frankly, is to, um, to utilize all of the money that they've set aside for scholarships. There's no benefit to the institution or to students to hold on to that money. Uh, so uh, the practice, I think, in general has been uh, to pay out what they collect. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. So through you, Madam Speaker, since the money that has been collected has been used, obviously for the right reasons and for the right student, and as the good chair said, maybe trying to attract a particular student or students to the university, so if this amendment and then the underlying bill about to move forward, so a student now, a legal student, a student born, brought up in this country and is a legal student, legal citizen in our country, if that person were to apply and suddenly the funds have dried up because obviously, if this amendment were to move forward, the funds would be given to some other student, deserving, no question about that at all. We're not talking about merit, 
we're not talking about the socioeconomic status. We're talking about just the legal status. So if the money is given to that student, will it mean that some other student who has also applied would be denied, who may have not been denied if this amendment were not to go through? To you, through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Through you, Madam Speaker, um, thank you for the, for the question. Um, uh, I, I think that the premise of the question actually is um, uh, sort of a doomsday uh, <laughs> a prediction about uh, uh, undocumented students exhausting uh, the existing aid pool. I'd, I'd say a, a couple things in response just to, to illuminate the issue. One is uh, that we're talking about a very large sum of money um, in the end. Um, I think it's close to 130 or $140 million uh, statewide at our public institutions that are distributed this way. Um, the population of undocumented students, um, uh, you know, I don't have a number, but, but it's, uh, it's quite small uh, compared to the total population, student population. All, all of the institutions themselves, the University of Connecticut, um, and folks from the Board of Regents institutions have indicated that they do not think that this will significantly inhibit their ability to provide uh, aid to the existing pool of eligible students. Um, I think um, it is very unlikely, frankly, that um, a student would find themselves in the position where they were denied uh, a scholarship of institutional aid based on um, the pool expanding larger, it may turn out that the average awards, which are all set by the institutions themselves, um, may be slightly smaller, negligibly smaller. The average uh, award at a, um, at, you know, well, there's a wide range, but at a community college, the awards range from about $700 to, to $1,400, depending on the school. Um, at uh, our state institutions, the awards average uh, somewhere between $2,700 and $3,700. Um, I think that uh, in the instance that um, in the, in the uh, uh, what, was, what is likely to happen if this bill were to pass um, is a couple of things. One is I think that uh, clearly uh, you know, awards that are given to undocumented students will come out of the same pool. I think we'll likely see an increased number of scholarships being awarded and perhaps the average award amount will drop a couple dollars um, but I think that uh, they will work very hard to ensure that particularly need-based students who need the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the aid to ensure that they can attend college will be taken care of first. Um, and it's really the merit scholarships that might um, be, uh, see a more significant impact. Um, but I think that, uh, again, because of the respective sizes of the different population, uh, both the Board of Regents and the Uni University of Connecticut have estimated that this would not have a uh, noticeable impact on the awards that are granted to eligible students. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Madam Speaker, I definitely am not thinking in terms of doomsday. Far from that, far from that. But my question is that since the institutional dollars on a yearly basis, the million dollars, you know, the, I heard $140 million that have been set aside for this, have been used consistently year after year after year because that much of a need is there in our state, both whether it be need-based, whether it be merit-based, or a combination of the two. It is my understanding, unless the good chair corrects me, that at the end of each year, we are not left behind with a significant amount or even a decent amount of money left back in the pot because we do not have students needing that money. So what could happen if this were to move forward, as I just heard, in order to accommodate this group of students we don't know how big they're going to be. We have no idea as to the number of applicants that are going to be. The only two ways it can happen would be either the award per student, as the good chair just mentioned, would be reduced. And what might look like a small reduction, what might look like not a significant reduction, I'm not so sure 
the parent or the child or the student will feel the same way when there is a sudden reduction in what has been from the past to what they are getting right now. And so through you, Madam Speaker, do we know what the reduction would be when these students also apply? Or it is a question of just estimating and guessing that we will be giving out the same amount of money, the $140 million, give or take, but we don't know whether all our students, legal students, A, will continue to get the aid, and B, by how much the aid would be reduced. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, um, I appreciate the question. Again, I would just reiterate that both representatives from the Board of Trustees uh, of the University of Connecticut and the University of Connecticut's Financial Aid Office and also uh, the Board of Regents um, indicated that the effect would be uh, manageable and negligible. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Could the good chair expand on manageable and negligible? That's the key part. That's the part that I'm most concerned about. So for me to hear, yes, it is manageable, yes, it's negligible, without knowing what the numbers are going to look like is what my concern is with this amendment. So do we, since the universities have already responded to the good chair as to what is manageable and what is reasonable, maybe he could share that with us this afternoon. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Through you, Madam Speaker, I think that the institutions themselves are uh, aware of the current body of, well, they don't keep account of the current body of un undocumented students. They're aware that there's activists on campus, typically, and they are aware of what that sort of population generally would be the size of. At the University of Connecticut, I think we're probably talking, um, you know, dozens, maybe a hundred or so students that might qualify. In a student body the size of the University of Connecticut, which is upwards of 20,000, um, uh, the university does not anticipate that uh, making this group of citizens, uh, this group of uh, students uh, eligible for uh, institutional aid will impact um, the, you know, significantly impact the, the awards that they, that they make and their enrollment thing. I would I'd also say that, you know, we are precluding, of course, the option that, um, uh, that making uh, undocumented students eligible for financial aid, a small award, might make the difference between them going or not going. Again, um, that might actually add to the pool of uh, folks who are paying into the system um, and that would, of course, mitigate any losses that you see um, from, uh, from the reduction. As well, we've heard testimony from the Board of Regents that says that while you know, their finances are you know, not nearly as simple as what we're describing today, um, they, they rely on a variety of different income sources and a variety of different um, uh, uh, you know, revenue sources and a variety of different, ex you know, they have a variety of expenses. That, that, the, that the risk of, of unfilled seats in the, in the, at our state institutions, um, um, according to testimony from the Board of Regents, actually poses a greater threat to the affordability of college uh, than um, allowing a small pool of folks to be eligible for institutional aid for the first time. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. So through you, Madam Speaker, if I understood the good chairman clearly by giving, granting this aid, we actually will be increasing, number one, the enrollment in our universities, and number two, we would be more attractive to the various sources of funding. Is that what the good chairman was trying to tell us? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Yes, through you, Madam Speaker. I think that uh, particularly at community colleges where there are empty seats, um, uh, filling uh, that, that seat with a student who has received uh, some institutional aid or a tuition discount. You know, it's already occurring. I mean, there are some community colleges that are offering in-state tuition rates to uh, out-of-state students um, because the, you know, they understand that the, having a student pay uh, tuition, the majority, the bulk of their tuition rate um, is better for the institution than having the seat uh, uh, be unfilled. Um, and so um, I think that this is a, uh, you know, a, 
I, I, I fully appreciate the question that's being asked. Um, I, I, I think that it is a that there's a complicated answer that has to do with how do we maximize uh, revenue source, uh, the revenue that comes in through tuition, through enrollment, how do we ensure that we are filling as many seats as we can, um, and, uh, and how do we use our institutional aid uh, to uh, both attract students and, um, and, and maintain our enrollment levels. Um, that, I think, is the reason why the Board of Regents and the Board of Trustees have both, um, at the University of Connecticut, both support this legislation. Um, it allows them to attract students uh, to their institutions um, in a way that will be uh, beneficial both to the students, um, the existing student body, and to the institution's financial well-being, um, as well as providing a small benefit to uh, the undocumented student. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Trina Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker. So when, these stu when students apply for financial aid, if this amendment and then the bill were to move forward, then all these students, regardless of whether they are legal, illegal, regardless of their status, as I understand it, as I would look at it, would fall into one pool. These are the students that are applying for financial aid. This is their financial need. This is their academic record. And then they would qualify for whatever the institution is capable of giving. So would they just be one common pool of applicants, or would these applicants be kind of reviewed and looked at differently, and then decide, A, are we going to be giving all of them financial help, or are we going to limit the amount of students in this group that will get such a help? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, that is uh, left to the discretion of the institution. Um, all of our institutions have uh, enrollment strategies to ensure that they um, are attracting uh, the student body that they feel would uh, do uh, good service to the state of Connecticut and to their institution. Um, and um, they're constantly doing projections based on enrollment for the resources that they have available to run their systems. Um, uh, institutional aid is one of the tools that they use to implement those enrollment strategies, um, and I think that to the extent that this legislation um, allows them to provide uh, inst uh, institutional aid to students um, from Connecticut, who uh, meet the qualifications um, and help them continue to uh, maintain a fiscally sustainable system, um, I think that the legislation is certainly worthy of passage on the merits of that alone. I, I do also think that it is, of course, a benefit to the individual students um, who will receive the award. Um, of course, we're talking about folks who were, uh, you know, a, a $1,500 award might make the difference between whether they can attend a uh, community college or not or a $2,000 award may make a difference for whether they can attend uh, Western Connecticut or Central Connecticut State University. Um, and to that extent, um, when they f the, the institutions have told us that when they fill those seats with awards of that size, that, they, um, that, that, that helps them meet their financial goals. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Madam Speaker, since the pool is defined with an X amount of capacity, 140, 150, give or take, million dollars. Through you, Madam Speaker, will, will the institution, will it be up to the institution to decide that to grant some amount of financial aid to all of those who apply and obviously reduce the amount that they get? Or will there be students left without any financial aid at all, because at the end of the day, when the $140 million have been used up, the institution has to decide what the institution needs to do. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker. Um, I think that the situation is actually far more dynamic than what you are describing. Um, the, the accepted policy in the state of Connecticut is that institutions should set aside 15% uh, of their tuition revenues for institutional aid. Um, at the University of Connecticut, that practice is currently closer to 17%. Uh, 
Um, some of the community college, most of the community colleges hover around 15%. And our state universities actually do far better. Some of them, um, well, Eastern um, sets aside uh, a great, greater than 30% of their tuition for institutional aid, according to a research report that um, I'm looking at from February of this year. Um, and so what you see is that institutions control not just the awards that they make to students, but also they control the amount of tuition revenue that they set aside uh, for that aid. Um, it's a very dynamic situation. Um, they use all of those tools, um, first and foremost, to ensure that the system itself um, is, uh, is financially sustainable. Um, they also, as you know, also set their own, uh, not, not institution by institution, but the Board of Regents sets the, in, sets the tuition rate and the Board of Trustees sets the tuition rate for the University of Connecticut. All of these things are factored in um, to uh, their overall strategy and their overall strategy is left to their discretion uh, to ensure the fiscal stability of, the, of their institutions. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Madam Speaker. So as the institutions set aside a certain percentage, 15, 17, whatever, whether it be a community college or the university, for institutional aid, and as the demand goes up, agreed, it could be marginal now, but who knows what's going to happen down the line. So when that demand or the need goes up, and obviously we do want to give our students aid, maybe a, a few dollars less, maybe a hundred dollars less, a couple hundred dollars less maybe, but we will give them aid. Is it possible because of that, the tuition itself for all the students would go up through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I think there are a number of factors that go into the, the, the decisions they make uh, uh, for setting tuition. Um, I don't actually think that this legislation will have a significant impact on the tuition rates at our state universities, although that's certainly left to them. Far more important, I think, would be the, uh, the size of our block grants that we grant to the universities and colleges. Um, as you know, that's been in decline for a number of, of years. And um, um, I, 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 frankly, I think if they were looking at an act of the legislature uh, to try to determine what their future projections were be, would be for tuition, they would probably be looking first and foremost at our appropriations uh, bills um, and not whether or not this particular uh, bill passed. They have the tools uh, and the discretion to act accordingly based on um, all of the factors I said before. They get to set their tuition rates. They set the policy uh, for the tuition set aside. Uh, and they have discretion to uh, make the awards uh, in the best interest of the student body and of their institutions. Through you, Madam, through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When a student applies for institutional aid, and is an undocumented, undocumented immig uh, immigrant here. Three, Madam Speaker, that student, if he or she were to apply for a federal grant at the same time, would that federal grant be something that the student is capable of receiving? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Hatter. Do you, Madam Speaker, no, this population is not eligible for federally sponsored uh, Pell Grants or Work Study Awards um, or other state uh, taxpayer funded scholarship funding. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. So through you, Madam Speaker, the student will not be eligible, would not be eligible for any federal dollar in terms of grants, would not be eligible for any taxpayer dollar. So the, the eligibility is only through the institutional dollars. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Through you, Madam Speaker, yes, that's correct. Representative Srinivasan. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the good chair for his answers. I'll be continuing to listen to the debate as we discuss this very important issue before us. Thank you, Madam Speaker.